Good morning, please, sir, Dr. Hemant Deshko of this twin institutions and uh, HODs of departments of physiology and anatomy and various heads of different departments which have come over a year, all senior faculty members, my friends and dear students. Today, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the twin institutions St. GS Medical College and KM Hospital and the societies of KM, namely Research Society, Staff Society, the Department Development Fund, Diamond Jubilee Society Trust and Kosumar Alumni Association. The, it's the legacy of these two institutes to hold Congress of Orations, which is aptly called as Orecon. And today we are holding the fourth Orecon of this year. As it is rightly said, the best is always saved for the last. And therefore, today, as we come to the last Oregon of 2018, we have two apt orations for today. That is Dr. A.C. Duan Montario oration, which will be taken delivered by the eminent speaker, Dr. K.K. Deepak Sir, as Professor and Head Department of Physiology, Ames, New Delhi. And this will be followed by G.M. Kurukar oration, which, is, which will be delivered by Dr. Lopa Mehta, ex-professor and Head Department of uh, Anatomy. I said the best part is that this is the first Oregon which is undergoing live streaming. So it is not only that the, the audience which is there at this theatre 3, but even at various other venues of the college building and even the faculty and students can access this on their mobiles wherever they are in their boards and the OPDs. So I now invite Dr. Geeta to start the sessions and conduct the physiology operations. Thank you Dr. Rakhi. A warm welcome to all. On behalf of the Department of Physiology, I would like to welcome all our esteemed guests, the HODs and HODs of the various faculties over here. Now I would like to request our esteemed HOD, Dr. Shenyu Madam, to greet our Dean Sir, Himan Deshu Sir, with a floral bouquet. Mm -hmm. Professor and head LTMMC sign with a floral bouquet. <laughs> and the esteemed guests are the chief guests for today's, today's event. The speaker, Dr. K.K. Uh, Deepak Sir, Professor and head from Ames, New Delhi. Request Dr. Ria to welcome Dr. Lalita Ma'am, Professor and Head, HBT, uh, HBT Medical College and Google Hospital with a floral bouquet. <laughs> so let me take this opportunity to in introduce our chairperson, Dr. Ara Deshpande sir, who is Professor and Head of LTMMC Science Medical College, on to be raised to briefly introduce our prominent speaker. Yes, sir. It's indeed a great pleasure. This hall has been uh, my home right from 76 till uh, 87. I mean, I have spent about uh, 15 and a half years in this institution. So to come back here from that end to this end, it has been a great pleasure for me. I would thank the organizers to have uh, uh, called me here and given this uh, opportunity. Now, uh, Dr. K.K. Deepak ke baare mein kuch bolna ho, to is vajan se hi aap uh, andaza laga sakte hai ki how much must be uh, his contribution to the field of uh, you know, physiology. And the AP synopsis hai, ek tam sangshit mein. If you really go to, uh, for, uh, you know, the articles and all that, ho toh itna ban jayega. See, and uh, we are deeply interested in hearing him. And therefore, I'll be extremely brief about uh, introducing him here. Uh, Dr. Deepak obtained his MBBS degree uh, way back in 1981 from uh, the Government Medical College, Bhopal. Then postgraduate degree MD physiology in 1984 and PhD uh, in physiology in 1990 from AIMS, uh, Delhi. Uh, following that in uh, uh, 87 he was uh, he has been I mean recently also he has been awarded uh, the DSC degree from Bangalore and uh, 
you know, it's it's uh, many things are uh, you know, you know mind boggling even to me. Uh, you know, uh, the setting of the heart rate variability and blood pressure variability, the whole autonomic uh, function uh, laboratory uh, at AIMS and uh, things which really strike me is this, uh, we have heard about many you know, ECG, EEG and everything. Now this is EGG, uh, electro gastrography. Hmm. These are all advanced things which are coming up and his association not only with medical uh, field but also uh, Indian Institute of Technology at various places in the country and not only here, even abroad, there are so many cities uh, right from US and uh, USSR and so many things. Hey, he has been a great person, we have to really appreciate his contribution to the field of uh, physiology and its uh, uh, you know advancement. and. Uh, since he has requested me to be extremely brief, you will appreciate his work in physiology much much more when you hear about it and we are all anxious to hear you about you sir and uh, with this brief introduction, I thank the organizers. May I invite you uh, to take over the mic sir. sir. I appreciate uh, AM and Professor for inviting me and giving me opportunity to share here. I might have come here 20 years before in some connection of workshops and other things. And Dr. Prashantika was here. So with that, I uh, quickly go to my topic. And since the time is important, I should honor time and we should honor time. But I try to speak in squeeze one hour and see how I do the justice. So, uh, with this, do you have a point in view? Okay, so first I pay tribute to Professor Montevio, he was actually here 46 and 61. Uh, but imagine, post retirement, 10 years he worked on. Post retirement, 10 years he worked on and gave him Peter's post graduate physiology. So, those who been post graduate here, we should salute to him, we started MD physiology here after uh, knowing that MSc was permanent here. So after MSc in physiology started and uh, he's listed, if you look at the Cohen uh, people in science and technology, he's one of the listed doctors in uh, uh, medical sciences. So what have we been doing here for nearly 30 years? Uh, we at AIMS doing five things in my department under my supervision and that is, uh, can I have point of view? To shut. Thank you. So I might need it. What we've been doing for nearly two years in the department of physiology, providing continuous clinical testing in optimal function testing. By the time I finish my talk, two patients have been tested in my back, back in my lab. It's an autonomous lab, it's working, it works without me, and that's why I would make systems which works without any head of the office. That's the echo system. We are doing a lot of research, nearly 100 publications in field of autonomic nervous system. MSL the autonomic nervous system is a part, one tenth part of the whole department. It's not a big, I'm talking about one tenth of my department contribution. Training we are providing hundreds, nearly, nearly thousand people we have trained in autonomic nervous system. So, Gurita is one sitting here, attended autonomic nervous system several times, I think two or three times. So, we are, we are giving this training to the countrymen. Uh, we are doing technology development. Right here, IIT Bombay, we have a communication. We are developing blood pressure devices, Indian devices with IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi, and IIT Jalanda. And we are doing that in physiology. Today, I am meeting in the bar regarding that connection. So, we are doing technological development, we are doing database development for the country. So, we have uh, uh, this kind of uh, thing which is going on.
70 students, MD, PhD, DM, MSc, and others, all the DMV also, and uh, 100 publications, there are 300 communications, and 20,000 human database available with us in our lab. And you all, anyone can use it. We are making it national database, we are making a historical database, so anyone want to have this database access, it, it will be available in future. I am not going into details of uh, this, what we have done here. So, um, for physiologists, what is most important to do research in physiology? Like for a surgeon to do a surgery, for medicine to see a patient, what is physiology? So, level one research is important. And that's what if you do in physiology, do physiology, in a way so that your physician and surgeons are benefited. And at the end, I'll tell you how we can benefit them, how we can become consultant to them. We treat it as a consultant at AIMS for surgeons and physiologists. They call us in ICU, they call us in uh, OTs, they call us uh, whenever they require, and that's what. This is level one research doing auto function research on itself, how to develop a test. Level two research to see what how your body behaves, how your body behaves to a natural response. For example, physical exercise. Or for example, you are exposed to my, to my gravity. So this is kind of a thing we can uh, do a research. I am not going to detail because I am going, going to focus on uh, something else. Level 3 research is again important when you give an insult to the body. You will use blood pressure, say by 20 minutes, you can do it very well in physiology part. By a type of maneuver or by a head down tilt or by a low body negative pressure, there are several devices by which you can change your blood pressure. We can change the heart rate and then see how it behaves in that scenario. So that's a physiological insult and that actually happens many times in the body when a person feels partial hypotension. And the level 4 is the disease which we have done. So what disease we have investigated? Nearly 3, three dozens of diseases we have investigated from autonomous point. Almost all this has been published. Just put this word and on the net and put one of the authors and you'll find it. So we have documented what happens to autonomic nervous system, uh, which is the autonomous system, in various diseases and that's what we have. We also done several intervention studies. Once we know autonomic abnormality there, how it can be corrected. For example, electrogastrography example was given. We use electrogastrography, <coughs> extract it, put on video and give a biofeedback. Therefore, if you give a biofeedback signal, you can modify the signal. That's one of the examples. In that way, various uh, intervention studies, several in intervention studies have been done. So what we have did, uh, developed is a battery of tests. Starting 1989, when we set up the first lab, the battery of Autonomous Function Lab, in the first time in the country, we set up a physiology department to provide clinical services to the clinical colleagues. And our patients are being referred from almost every department whenever they have a postural hypertension, whenever they have an autonomic abnormality, neurology department, cardiology department, geriatrics, medicine, endo, dermatology, uh, ENT, and uh, wherever there is a problem uh, in this. So the, for the first battery, this is, this is being referred to us. Then we also develop autonomic tone and activity. And during the process, I let you know how you can quantify your tone. Some people have, people have <coughs> higher sympathetic tone, some have lower sympathetic tone. How non invasively you can quantify. Then we develop the test in our lab and set up for blood flow measurement, blood pressure variability, how your blood pressure is fluctuating, how you can quantify it. If we develop our own software, we develop our own equipment on uh, equipment to quantify blood pressure. Then biofluid sensitivity, <coughs> electrogastrography. Leoencephalography, impedance cardiography with the help of bark. We work with the bark intensively to thousand six onwards and uh, uh, and work on how we can quantify cardiac output in uh, yeah, in, in cath lab. So we used to go to the cath lab and we quantify cardiac output. And full fledged vascular function lab is functioning now. We have a full fledged ultrasound imaging and online imaging of vessels and then we can quantify. This is all happening in the Department of Physiology. So quickly come, what kind of interest? This is one of the examples that we look for how the breathing, I'm going to focus on breathing, how can breathing be used as a modifier for your pathological conditions, for example, diabetes mellitus. And we showed categorically, this has been published 
or it in any general endocrinology metabolism that the yogic breathing has a preventive effect on cardiac myocarditis. The diabetic patient they have cardiac myocarditis. And if you give the yogic breathing or modified breathing, then it improves. So this is one of the examples, and there are several examples. We gave examples of encephalitis, fetal ball syndrome, epilepsy, and several other disorders where we have shown the effect or uh, effect. So we put up a hypothesis long back. This is uh, 1991. I hope you will know hypothesis. So I will talk about four hypotheses and try to prove my point. How the modification of breathing and respiration can be helpful on Earth or on in space. And take you to the journey to the space and how it can actually modify. So the hypothesis we put resting respiratory rate influences heart rate variations during slow breathing tests. Any one of you can do this. It's a simple test. Simple life. Doesn't require much of the input. You just require to monitor the respiration and see what happens to the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And that was a good paper. It shows that respiratory rate did not inf influence heart rate variations, that is RSA, during deep breathing test. And that's important when we are establishing a test. People were saying, your respiratory rate is vague, so what? If you measure heart rate. Now we showed it clearly, no, it does not affect which means RSA is an independent marker of your autonomy. That's the way back we did it and that gave us confidence. So with this uh, we went further. This is a known diagram to you all and try to figure out and then come out how things are influencing the interaction between respiration and heart rate. Heart rate and blood pressure. Respiration and blood pressure. And what do you think how these three things are working and how they are actually making a rhythm and this is what. And in between comes the biochemical parameter. Also in between comes the brain which also influences. And there may be some other factors which I am going to tell you about. And I am also going to tell about how anatomy works with physiology like over here. So this is what I'm, this is going to be my main diagram which I am going to come up come again and again. What has been shown earlier, <coughs> the respiration influences heart rate by RSA, well known. Heart rate actually gets reflected in terms of heart rate variability, your heart rate is not constant, therefore it reflects, it tells you about the autonomic tone, basically autonomic tone uh, to heart. The respiration also affects your blood pressure, and blood pressure can be reflected in terms of blood pressure variability which can be reflected in terms of sympathetic gravity respiration. Therefore, the baroreflex becomes a very important operating point in regulation of your autonomic functions. If baroreflex is affected, your autonomic regulation will be affected. And uh, therefore, there are several oscillators, several oscillators in the system which are oscillating at your own. Respiration is oscillating, oscillating heart rate is oscillating, Red vessels are oscillating at 0.1 hertz, and also these oscillations are being generated in the brain. And so this, so it's an interplay of various oscillators, which is important if you study these oscillations and see its effect. You can actually figure out uh, what is happening to the physiology. You can apply this physiology to the clinical scenario because these oscillations are actually effective. So if you look at the respiration effects, first heart rate or blood pressure. I give this question to you. You will hold for a second. It is affecting first heart rate or blood pressure. Now, what has been known? It affects blood pressure first before heart rate. You know about RSA, you know about respiratory sinus arrhythmia, but this point has been proven that if you're taking inspiration in, when you take inspiration in, your blood pressure falls. This is systolic blood pressure. And that equation is very important, which means the respiration is a modifier of blood pressure. Therefore, can I put a question? Can I use my respiration to increase or decrease my blood pressure? Suppose I am in a difficult situation. I am uh, flying at 8G or 9G and I am losing my blood pressure. I am a, uh, a fighter aircraft and I know my blood pressure. Can I do something so that I increase my blood pressure? Otherwise, I will succumb to death. And that's what happened when the fighter uh, flies and it goes up here. So, 
this is what how can respiration be used as in acute emergencies to modify your respiration. That's one equation. The long equation, how respiration modification can, can help my autonomic and diabetes, and that's another equation. So there's the two equations by which so what I'm trying to show here, respiration is a big modifier your blood pressure. Besides heart rate, and that's the equation. So the second hypothesis we put the resting respiratory rate influences blood, blood, blood volume pulse. Now look at what how we are doing simply. The respiration influences my the RSA, we have already proven. The respiration influences my pulse volume. Again, a very simple experiment. Anybody can do it simply. You change your respiration profile and you record your pulse form here. And this pulse is very much recorded by recordable by this one. They are not difficult experiment, experiment, but they give you a lot of huge value in science and technology, in uh, physiology and medicine, both areas. <coughs> Look at this is the graph which we show and this we have already published in one of the journal, IGMT. And uh, if you look at here, uh, if you look at here, this is the ECD, and uh, on ECD we have superimposed the pulse. So you, your ECG is going on, and radial pulse is going on. So I can find out the pulse transit time, how much time my blood takes for my heart going to the pulse. It's very easy to do it. Anybody, any of you who can do it, right with your mobile. You don't need anything else to do this. Just simple mobile will give you this information that how much time my blood taking from my heart to my pulse and that will give you the huge information about your sympathetic tone, your vascular conditions, are the vessel compliant or not, this is what the information. So what we showed here, these are, the, are three area under a curve on pulse which we have recorded. What we have shown here, if you look at here, this diagram actually tells you <coughs> That if I do a not slow bullying, six cycles per minute, which is a dynamic bullying, slow bullying, my timing, take the pulse to pulse interval, a pulse transit time, the time taken for my heart to two vessels, it actually changes and from 186 it becomes 198. So when I do slow bullying, the blood flow from my heart to this actually expands. Which is my timing of the pulse are determined by the rate of the breathing. And that's a big deal. It's a big deal. If you know it, you can quantify my sympathetic tone, you can quantify what is happening to my uh, blood vessels, and this is this is what we the timing of the pulse are ordered by slow expression and not the amplitude. And not the amplitude, underline. And that gives a very big this work we did with IIT jelly. We took hand to the IT Delhi and we did work. On this basis, several equipments are being developed now. You will find in the market, PTT is being used as a marker for blood pressure. You can determine your blood pressure by knowing PT, pulse transit time. So it's a big deal that you, you can do measure blood pressure by this, but you can also uh, determine blood pressure by PTT. So that's one. So to finish the two hypotheses, I come to hypothesis three. Now we are known. The respiration is influencing your heart rate, your pulse volume, but we were more interested does it influence your vascular function. And vascular function includes a lot anymore. Then it also includes uh, um, changes by chemical parameters and uh, autonomic controls. I told you autonomic controls can be determined by biofluid sensitivity. If you have uh, if you have heart rate variability and blood pressure variability, you can quantify biofluid non-invasively and therefore uh, uh, we started doing some of the research. One of the initial research we found that there is a significant increase in regular activity after less nostril breathing. And how did we find out? We took the subjects, we asked them to do right nostril breathing and left nostril breathing or other. We only determined heart rate variability. And to determine heart rate variability is again easy, your heart rate is fluctuating. It's changing from 70 to 80, 80, 70, 70 to 80 or 90, something like that. If you determine the variability in this, this actually tells me the reflex loop operation. Suppose my heart rate is transplanted heart. I have transplanted heart, my heart rate will be fixed. It will not change because it does not have supply. The moment it has supply, uh, the vagal supply or sympathetic supply, then
then my heart rate will go. Which means what we showed here categorically that like nostril breathing actually increases my vapor flow. It decreases blood flow. So that was a simple experiment which we performed and we were very excited doing this. Again, this is long back 2004 we published. This gave us uh, much more idea that <coughs> I put up a hypothesis presented again in 2002 and that hypothesis I put up uh, has been already published, available on Google Scholar or uh, any other web. What did I say? And that explained the whole mechanism of uh, breathing effect on, advantageous effect on disease condition. How pranayam helps you in diabetes? And that's what I'm going to talk about. If you convince that it is convincible that yoga works or breathing works, I did I said that rhythmic, short lasting hyperventilation efforts within physiological limits, like fast breathing. Simple. Repeated episodes of sympathetic excitation. Which means if I do that, I'm stimulating my sympathetic nervous system repeatedly. So there's an ordered sympathetic activity and there's a better ability tolerate the stress episode. So what I am trying to say that if you take a deep breath and very fast breath, you are exciting your sympathetic nervous And in long term, as a, as a matter of practice, it gets blunted. And that's all. Further, repeated short lasting hyperventilation efforts. So this is a gradual recovery of sympathetic tone with each episode and relaxing yet thinking clearly. This is a simple hypothesis. Uh, 2002 and that was presented in one of the international conferences, it was published as a paper. Now, what I am trying to say, two things, if you give short bursts of synthetic excitation, the way you do an exercise, the body has capability to adapt and to find a newer level of function. A newer level of function is a better function in terms of physical, in terms of uh, mind and that's why the paradigm is known to influence two things your cognitive function and also your ability to tolerate change in blood pressure. <coughs> so if you do pranayam or if you do this, chances that you will not shout, you will not increase your blood pressure, okay. chances you will think clearly. So that was a hypothesis. So in 2002 we thought this is a hypothesis, how can we prove it? How to prove it? So what do we require to prove it? We require the whole setup. So we put up the objective that we want to see the effect of pranayam on all functions related, starting from heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, their relationship, biochemical, and the brain function. It becomes a big team. He was studying that the whole. So this is what we decided, and we decided that we give uh, the whole uh, well laid down protocol. We give five minutes of pranayam of different types, different types. There are several types, uh, and then do this and then also find out what happens after that. So that was a beautiful experiment uh, we came. So we gave all six types of pranayam known. Beautifully they have been worked out 5000 years ago by our sages. It's all documented. We are so surprised at how scientifically they have listed. We just took them and uh, took all these pranayam. I'm not going to details of this. It's all well known uh, uh, philosophy. But uh, today I'm only going to present the results of Alternate nostril breathing, A and B. Time does not permit to me go to all, so that's what. Uh, so this is a setup. Not difficult setup. Most of the equipment are available here in KM. Uh, 100 percent sure. <coughs> it's not with you, they are nice Or they are in anesthesia. Very easy to borrow. We, we, we borrow things and we give them. We give them anesthesia people. I go to OT and we'll tell them, uh, monitor anesthesia and predict. If you give cerebrofilin anesthesia, will it go to the work better? If you take a diabetic patient to the OT and he's got a diabetic uh, autonomy compromise, how he will behave after surgery? That's what we do. We predict that the anesthesia will be a little longer, don't worry. We tell the relatives this he's got an autonomy dysfunction, therefore uh, he'll take a little longer. And that's what uh, so that's what we work and we borrow equipment, sometimes we borrow capnos from them, now we have our own. So what is required? You require brain function, FNIR, measured CO2, respiratory parameter, 
take blood pressure from finger, continuous BP monitor, take uh, pulse and take less pressure. All this is uh, doable and that person is inspected. This is very well comfortable. You capture all the signals on the computer. It's all doable and then you get a report like this. Once you have this report like this, you can determine what happened to various signal. This is a brain oxygen signal. We record it from uh, brain, uh, from, uh, by using uh, 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 oxymeter. Again, it's very easy to do. And entire CO2, which will tell us whether CO2 is changing or not. Is it, I am changing the CO2 levels by doing so I am breathing or not. If I am changing that, it is a CO2 signal which is causing a change. So this is what why we have recorded. So the only this thing, uh, A and B, alternate nostril breathing, uh, which is called Nalishuti, Banyam, we took. So we took huge data came out of We collected large amount of data before doing the recovery, the recovery. And what we have recorded, we recorded 12 parameters uh, here. And we also recorded uh, uh, analyzed parameters, which is the second element, derivative uh, parameters. And uh, so we could tell us about, look at the last column, cardiac autonomic flow. We could tell us about the continuous BP reporting, which will tell us about the blood pressure and the relationship with the heart rate, uh, the way of the sensitivity. So we, we could know about the cardiovascular system we have to uh, we could see the hemisphere right, right and left brain functioning. We could see the relationship between heart rate and blood pressure. So we, we could get everything on table and we could identify uh, these things. So uh, these are some of the parameters which actually uh, form HRV heart rate variability. As I told you, heart rate variability is a variability continuously, and this variability can be quantified by simple statistics, find out the standard deviation, or find out the standard deviation of next to next uh, uh, beat intervals and from there you actually get most vital marker for parasympathetic parasympathetic to activity. You also can do frequency domain analysis. So if it is oscillating at what frequency my heart uh, heart rate is oscillating and that can be comfortably uh, determined and you get an idea about parasympathetic tone or sympathetic tone or parasympathetic sympathetic ratio which is a um, sympathetic balance. Look at what we could call The top actually uh, shows before pranayam at the rest, the middle one during pranayam, and the low one post pranayam. Two important effects of observation. During pranayama, average heart rate beat went to 82 beats per minute, suggesting that from 77 to 82, suggesting towards sympathetic excitation. And also, this lasted for some time, even post exercise, post pranayama, which means the effect of pranayama when you do acutely overlast the stimulus. It is not a mechanical response. Something has been done to the system, to the brain that uh, sympathetic excitation loss uh, increases. Now, this be further proven. If you look at the further proven by doing a frequency analysis, that is a sympathetic excitation during alternated nostril breathing. And that's what is happening by looking at the frequency component of uh, this HRV because this HRV shows parasympathetic sym sympathetic quantification. This is sympathetic quantification, and you see during Parama, most of the power lies in the sympathetic flow. So we could quantify from here not invasively that sympathetic tone has gone up, something similar beautifully from here is shifting like this. This is sympathetic flow, and this is parasympathetic. The whole power shift is sympathetic and that was the way of proving our hypothesis that what we told in the beginning that perhaps it's mediated in sympathetic excitation during the pranayama. I am not talking about 10 years, 20 years or, or 20 days of excitation. That's a different matter. It will be blended later. And something similar also can be showed that the different type of pranayama have a different effect. And that was beautiful. That's why they suggest you do all different types. They have a differential effect and they have a differential effect in terms of right and left nostril breathing. If you look at these pranayama, they offer resistance, they offer change in speed, they offer uh, uh, producing sound and oscillation and evasion. So these are the different, look at the heart rate also, uh, even RSA, respiratory sinus arrhythmia is also good. So there are different type of pranayama. Again, different type of pranayama has a differential effect 
in terms of uh, sufficiency of it. It's, uh, it's not difficult to do it. I mean, look at what is happening to the relationship BRS. If you know the BRS, barrel sensitivity, it's a relationship of delta change in blood pressure to delta change in heart rate. If you change your blood pressure, your heart rate changes. So what is the slope like? And this slope actually reflects your bioflex sensitivity. So this bioflex sensitivity actually look at during A and B, there are so many sequences. <coughs> there should be sequence. When you change your blood pressure, they change your heart rate, they form the sequence. The number of sequences in the middle, there are so many. And look at after A and B. It quietens, it stills down, goes back. It is not like normal. It takes time to come back. So the relationship between heart rate and blood pressure, which has been fluctuating, oscillating, during breathing, it quietens down. And that's what uh, actually is changing your biofilm sensitivity. And this is a simple way we published an Indian about medical research. Uh, how you can do the same analysis by simply this is by using a pen and paper. You plot our intervals, which is heart rate. Blood pressure. This is blood pressure, and just see their correspondence. So during the pranayam, here you see the latency. So blood pressure is changing first before the heart rate, and this is induced by respiration. So my respiration is causing change in blood pressure first and later the heart rate, because if it is happening, time <coughs> it will be vertical line. If it is happening before, it will be vertical. And this can be done without using any computer. Just two reports, and this we did up with our own. So I always encourage do great science by simple thing, by simple doing simple thing. Not always you require all big equipment to prove your point of view. Something similar. Look at how beautiful this can be. There's a correspondence, a non-correspondence, and this is happening uh, during the uh, alternate notion. So this can be done, and this is which we could publish. This is what we do. But I'm going to skip some of the reports. Sir. So end tidal CO2 did not show any change. So when I'm doing what I am, my CO2 does not change. It's not I'm doing that way of hyperventilation that CO2 becomes a driver. So CO2 is not a driver and this is what. This is result from the brain. When we put electrodes here, these are off-roads, these are all off -roads. they take the light and from the light it's non-invasive and they actually test the subject. They can be 60, 8 on this side, 8 on this side, they test for the frontal, the frontal absorption. And from there you can record the oxygenation of the power of the So if you see the middle part, the brain circulation start oscillating with the same frequency I'm doing the breathing. The same frequency I'm doing the breathing, it just starts oscillating, and this is awesome. Which means you're increasing brain separation, and that could be a, that is the basis for why you get a better cognitive functioning during the pranayama. Now, so clearly, now if you look at here brain oxygenation, there was clear hemispheric differences. We told you about the right nostril breathing and left nostril breathing. Look at the reports here. They clearly showed whenever there is a resistance breathing, whenever there is a uh, drum weight, which is an anomaly, so in those end the CO2 was really significant. And also the hemispheric differences came up. Therefore, it becomes very important that these, they, they produce a differential effect on. Uh, so, uninostral breathing did not produce any uh, kind of uh, hemispheric differences. This is only binostral breathing. So this, we said that at rest we have a differential control. Either it's a right control or left control. This is what. Uh, so again, um, the, we took the coherence between uh, LF coherence and uh, HF coherence. Again, they showed the differential. So I come to the utility. So this is uh, this study explains the cognition. It actually can be used for uh, removing phobias or uh, removing the question and it has implication for the diabetic of cardiovascular immunity. Now coming to the same diagram again, how it can be used for further research? How the gravity is going to affect? Now if you look at the diaphragm, you have a liver. 
and you put person upside down, what will happen? The liver weight will be on the diaphragm. So, if in a vertical position, if you go to the space and you lose the weight, you will lose the weight of liver also. Liver is not, not no longer going to be hang below the diaphragm. So, what will happen to the diaphragm function? That is the question for the next generation. The research has not been done. If you have to come with a model and come here, the only one person from Dr. Naveen, physiologist from ESIC Medical College Bangalore, published a small note and that this may be one of the two elements effect. However, what I am going to talk about along with this other mechanical influence. I quickly come, this is the same equation. So, hypothesis 4, breathing modulate vascular, vascular function, autonomic controls and biochemical parameters in space, how does it happen in space? About 6 years ago, we set up a space physiology lab, if you happen to come to AIMS, walk in, you can see how we are doing space research at AIMS New Delhi. Uh, there are not many students are. So, will microgravity exposure affect the respiratory, cardiac, vascular relationship? You have to understand what happens in space when you lose the weight. If you are 70 kg, in a space you will lose 70 kg, you will become 0 kg. Your liver, which is 1.5 kg, becomes 0 kg. Then no longer, everything is floating. You are floating, your liver is floating. Your blood will be floating. If you go to a space, blood will lose the 5 kg weight. The 5 liters, 4.5 kg weight. Your blood will be floating within your vessels. And imagine, where, where will the blood go? If it floats within your vessels, and anybody think where it will be going? Where the blood will be going? It's floating, like a test tube. With the blood inside, go to the space, the blood is floating, you are floating, everything floating. So that's what we are going to do. I would encourage people to do this research because, because we are at the threshold. We are at the threshold of doing physiology, research and application. Within three years, some of you, one of you, will be going to the space. Didn't do it. It's a what do I do? So I will not focus all points, but I'll focus there's a fluid shift and there's a loss of weight of the body and all. So your blood will flow towards your head. Your head will get 10 or 20 percent more blood because the gravity was holding it down. Now gravity is not there, it will flow. The way you have a helium balloon, you are holding it. The moment you cut it, it goes up. And so your blood, your head will get a lot of blood, your legs will become like a chicken legs. Then you think your head will become like puffy, puffy head. Something similar will happen. Fluid will shift. So how you do confirmation? You do lower body negative pressure. You put the whole half body in a chamber, put in a negative pressure. If you put in a negative pressure, you will take shift the fluid back to your lower legs. And that's the confirmation. So currently we are trying to devise something like wearable devices which can be used in this space by shifting the blood from the head back to your lower limbs. So this is what the chamber we use. The person goes inside the half of it, you put in negative pressure, simply 10, 20, 30 or 40 millimeter mercury. The blood from the upper half shifts to the lower half and which is a countermeasure. So this is a countermeasure of microgravity. This is a countermeasure of microgravity. You, you produce anti-gravity situation here. How you can produce uh, gravity uh, situation? Person standing like this, all the situation, put 6 degree down. It becomes microgravity because 6 degree down your blood will shift from lower limbs to head. And that's what happens here. So you can simulate microgravity in your lab right over here. It's easy to do. So, I will quickly talk about in the next, next 10 minutes towards this and try to conclude it. So, how does slow breathing affect cardiovascular control, especially uh, in my gravity situation? One of the PhD students I'm here is doing this work and this is almost completed. So, how do you, how my gravity will affect your heart and rest of the that's what the main equation we were looking for. So we wanted to record heart rate variability, blood pressure variability, and central aortic. So what's happening to my central aortic pressure? And what is happening to anti the same equation we wanted to see. So this is all the standard protocol. So head up tilt, 70 degree tilt, we 
which is effect of the effort you do. Head down tilt, my two empty, you, you take away the empty, and low body negative position is a counter measure of my two empty. So you can counter the, the my two empty by doing this simple experiment. And these are doable. We designed a series of experiments, and we also designed that we will give them RNAM. Think what I'm trying to do. We are giving to RNAM slow building to the micro empty uh, exposures, and thinking that this will have application in space is all. So next time when person, we are not, or we call it not in India, not astronauts, when they go, they have a better physiology adapted that they can regulate their own uh, functioning and then they can do better. I must inform that long back NASA used head down training to the astronauts on Earth so that they become better astronauts on space. But nobody knows what to do that. Unless you be over there, you do not know what NASA is doing within the walls. They are doing all Indian things inside there and they are trying to use it. That's what we are trying to duplicate and do this. So this is a live experiment in a new scenario. So this is hypergravity. You hold it person here in 5 minutes. If you hold person in this situation for 40 minutes, any of you will fail. Any of you will fail. If you stand for 40 minutes, stand this way, without moving your legs, each one of you will fail. That's a hypergravity. Or you walk in a lift, you go in a lift for, for nearly 5 10 minutes, you will fail. That's it. Sure. So that's why it's a very strong stimulus. We do it for 5 minutes, similar to this kind of hypergravity. You put head down, it's a microgravity space type. You apply lower body negative pressure, it's a contribution. So we put simple experiment. And it's not a difficult device, you can make one. Then it requires a simple, simple pump, simple one pump. <coughs> and one intruder. Each can think of it doing it and you can do it. Guide over here. Simple container and one pump and this monitor. Everything is available at the tire uh, car portion. Tire portion, device is nothing but a quality portion. So I'd like to encourage you to do this. So we wanted to study effect of these parameters on this. What we found. We took those who do yoga for a long time and those naive to yoga. And we found that the yoga group had better parasympathetic functioning even at rest. So if, we do it, if you've been doing yoga, you have better cardiovascular functioning in terms of higher level to and that's what was reflected here. So that's a big report. But what also we found that the baseline composition of bioflex sensitivity, again, the yoga people had a better bioflex control. They could control the blood pressure better. Look at the values here. So if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the lower, cost, lower bottom values, the DVP is a better indicator and alpha HF which is indicator of parasympathetic functioning, you have 13 and this is significant difference. So if you be continuously doing yoga, your bioflex controls are better. So that's what we are saying, those who are doing yoga are better equipped to tolerate different changes. Something similar. Uh, finding in terms of RMMSP that uh, this we found. Look at here. This is a diaper blood pressure when we compare yoga group and this. So, if you look at maximum and minimum change, it is 1.35 and 1.31. It speaks volumes. Which means the normative person without yoga will be fluctuating blood pressure to a larger range than the one who is doing yoga. The yoga people will oscillate his heart rate in order to maintain blood pressure in a narrow way. And that is again it speaks volume. Uh, so we also found that when you do yoga, there is a frequency shift acutely. As I told you, as I showed you before. So the frequency shift to the sympathetic and that's what happens when you do yoga. And we also found that uh, when you expose to head up tilt, head down tilt, the significant Inclusion uh, parameters of uh, parasympathetic have also been formed. So then we compared within the groups and we found that bioflex sensitivity is one again very good indicator which actually tells that it becomes better. It is better when you expose them to 
uh, head down tilt. So therefore, this is clearly shows that head down tilt at a significantly higher wave of sensitivity uh, than uh, slow tilt. So uh, with the slow breathing, so we are seeing the effect of breathing, slow breathing on head down tilt, and it differentially affects head down tilt and normal and which is slow breathing is a differential modifier in different states like gravity, microgravity, and LBNP exposure. So it is differentially affecting these three conditions. Therefore, it will be differentially used. That, therefore, it's a big uh, modifier. And how does head down tilt affect vascular control? That again become a very important parameter. Again, I always talk of simple thing and going to think. You take the subject. We got his inspiration and expression, we got heart rate. You can take the heart rate at point, one point, ten point. Take subjects, we got like this, we got their blood pressure also, and try to record blood pressure and tracking, inspiration and expression. You can do like this, it's again a doable thing. You can plot like this. So look at this graph. Inspiration and expression, what is happening to the heart rate? This is nothing but RSA. But we are trying to do this concept of RSA, we want to compare this to what happens to my blood And that's why it's important that uh, I, this is what is happens to the blood So the relationship of blood pressure and heart rate between inspiration and expiration changes with various functions which I've been talking about abdominal tilt, adduct tilt, LBNP, and it keeps on changing in one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four. So it's like a fluid. The so relationship between blood pressure and heart rate changes with the function of inspiration and expiration, and it is differential at slow breathing, coronary breathing, and normal breathing. So it becomes a very good tool which actually can modify. This is what actually happens when you do like this. So this is head down tilt. The head down tilt, the actual uh, inspiration and expiration. Perhaps this is the effect of the liver. When the liver suddenly starts pressing your diaphragm, your the oscillations will not be very smooth. You need to learn that weight of the liver, 1 kg, put on your chest. It's as if 1 kg is being applied on your blood. So that's what uh, would be the future research that we try to search for why this is like this. Inspiration and explain why this is happening like this. When you see like this, and that's what opens up the new hypothesis, new ability. So I'm going towards the end, implication of this to the microbiology exposure. Slow and deep breathing may find utility as a countermeasure against space-flight induced cardiovascular changes. That's already there we are putting up in flight, hypergravity or microbiology. Slow breathing exercises may be used, microbiology conditions to improve parasympathetic tone and thus to improve heart rate and blood pressure variability. We can make it more stable. Effect of Bioflex may be studied to better understand blood pressure regulation in my states. So that's what is doable. I come to understand what we have been doing until now. We have been a lot of clinical physiology. A lot of clinical physiology. Many people, patients walk into physiology department with unknown problems of uh, hypotension. We differentiate. Many times people of epilepsy who have been given epilepsy drug are found not to have epilepsy but partial hypotension. We differentiate. We say no, this is not epilepsy. Why are you giving that? Epilepsy drugs and making person blunted for cognitive function. It's suffering from partial hypertension or some other kind of vascular problem which we can differentiate. Fundamental understanding to the respiratory physiology, cardiac and vascular. I've given one example. We have several funds we've been working. Advancement in space physiology application, nearly 10 projects we have done. Doing left and right and other things. What is happening to the going left? And it's model regulation. Improve undergraduate approach. We have advised NCI to include this at various levels. Now, on our advice, they included auto function testing at post period. It has never been there. Now we are asking them to uh, include some other uh, and method. So, with that, I come to an end. I hope you enjoyed my talk and I hope uh, this is. Uh, the future, the physiology is the basis of medicine, nobody should forget it to surgeons. Surgeons, when he puts a hand on cutting an organ, first he find, ask what is the level of function. And if I take out this level, what level of function is it? He cannot leave 
is only in that. You cannot take out an organ. You can't cut a leg without knowing that the, the another leg will be uh, falling short. You, you can't do that. No interoperative monitoring can be completed without knowing the physiological connection. Otherwise, the patient becomes the paralytic cause. So, uh, this is what I would end with, and uh, thank you so much for all the reminding. Thanks, sir. Now, how this will help? 
what actually happens, it happens in this uh, peripheral vascular conditions, your vessel becomes stiff. Your vessel becomes stiff. So, uh, therefore, blood pressure goes up and therefore, the, uh, uh, and because of the stiffness, the reference ABI uh, it, 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 it becomes less. It becomes less. Normally, low blood pressure is, should be more than 180. It should be 180 because of the gravitational effect. So, when you do breathing exercise, especially, your baroflex sensitivity increases, your vessels become more flexible and more compliant. The moment they become more compliant and flexible, they can accommodate more uh, blood pressure and therefore if they regain, changes back to ABA. Thank you. Is this 6 degrees still has a more Why is 6 degrees only? It's a celebrity. Very nice. Very nice question. Very important question, even the USA doesn't know this answer. We have been discussing with the UCLP. Currently, we are investigating. With Anandi Jalanda, we are studying what is actually happening at 6 degrees. So, we are putting subject in 0 degree, 4 degree, 6 degree, 10 degree, 30 degree. So, one of the students is studying what is happening. What we observed at 6 degree is a U turn in a heart rate. A why it is happening, that's what we are investigating. <coughs> at say, say 70 heart rate, you take it 4 degree, it becomes uh, 66. 6 degree, it may be 60 or 62. And the moment you go beyond, it becomes 80 degree, 80 heart rate. Now, the question you really do not know. Somewhere there is a switch, which is switching from parasympathetic activation to sympathetic activation. And this switching happens somewhere, and some sensor, the blood is going to, towards the health side, should be the fact. So they are still trying to find out, we are trying to get impedance reporting from both lower limbs and upper limbs. Somewhere there is a vascular and the cardiac switching, and that switching actually changes. And then we are thinking it will be different for different people. It could be 6 for you, it could be 5.5 for me to be 7 for someone. So that's a very good question. It's worth investigating. You can join, you can do this or not. Anyway, thank you. When we remove the normal physiology of respiration, like in ventilators or the way abnormal methods of respiration, does it change in the situation? Ventilation, like, like ventilation. Do you have any ventilation or yeah, on yeah. Uh, ventilatory machine? So does it change the blood and the heart rate? Yes, this changes. This changes and you have to synchronize with the normal body functioning. That's why various intelligent machines are not taking up clue from the body itself that when this patient should start, patient cannot take and you support. You support it ventilation. So these things have to be synchronized. Otherwise, uh, it will play haywire. They will be working. Uh, against each other because it's continuously uh, synchronized forever. So new intelligent machines are actually trying to sync with oscillations already existing oscillations. Thank you. Thank you so much.